Mike, I have heard that you're raising a $500 million hedge fund. What can you tell me? You know, I can't confirm or deny it. The SEC doesn't allow us to, but let me just tell you that I'm really excited about the space and I'm working real hard in it. Why? What, what on earth got you interested in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? You know, back when I was at Fortress, uh, I got a call from uh, one of my partners who was a, a traditional Luddite, uh, but he had moved out to the West Coast and everyone out there was talking about Bitcoin. So he called me up and he asked me to look into Bitcoin. And I literally spent an hour on the internet and at that point figured, this is a perfect uh, asset to see a speculative bubble in. And so my first instinct was, this is, hey, let's just play this for fun because it's going to go up because there are a lot of libertarians in the world, there are a lot of anti-government people in the world, and that the Chinese were getting into it. And so my first instinct was really that simple. And like a lot of things in life, once you start making money in them, you dig in and you try to figure out more and more. And, you know, it's been a journey where I've, uh, and it hasn't been all straight up. It went up, it went down. Uh, but we really quickly, you know, back, back when I was at Fortress, decided this could be something special. And we invested uh, not some on the firm's balance sheet and uh, some with a guy named Dan Moorhead who ran a, ran a fund out there. Uh, just to, thought, let's be in the ecosystem of the thing. And, you know, it, it actually kind of worked for a while and then went dead for a few years. And my interest with the volatility dying kind of also died down. And when I left Fortress, um, in 2015. In 2015, uh, I looked at my portfolio, uh, and I had a lot of bitcoins and and other investments in the space. And I said, "What am I going to do with these things?" And luckily enough, I had in, a, in your PA, in my PA, your personal account. And I had a roommate from college, uh, a guy named Joe Lubin, who was one of the key guys in building the Ethereum project. And at this point, Ethereum had had just launched, and I called him and. Uh, I say, Joe, can I come to your office and you can give me a tutorial on like what I own and, and really let's think through, should I keep this stuff, should I buy more? And I went over to Bushwick in Brooklyn. This would have been January of last year, 2016. And I expected to see Joe, a dog and one assistant. And I saw 30 dynamic young people crammed in a, in a, in a, in a Bushwick warehouse coding, uh, talking on the phone, making plans for this revolution. Uh, and then all of a sudden he pulled up video screens and there were people in other countries and he already had 40 employees. Uh, at this point, Ethereum was about 85 cents. And, you know, macro guys are instinctive. Uh, my instinct was, damn, I want to buy a chunk of this company. And literally, right then I was like, what does it cost to run this company per year? If I give you 10 million bucks, how much would it help? And as we started talking about a deal, uh, he said, you know, it's going to take me a while to, to figure out exactly what the company looks like because one of the unique things about this culture is it's distributed everything, distributed trust, distributed ownership. And so there were lots of sub-companies in that ecosystem and it was a bit of a spaghetti map of ownership. And so I was leaving to India and he said, you know what, give me a month, come back and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it. And, at least learn from trading. When you know something's good, buy something. And so I ended up buying a bunch of ethers when they were, you know, call it $1, uh, went away to India on a, on a trip, came back, and they were already trading 5 or $6. And at that point, the company consensus didn't need my capital anymore, uh, nor did I want to arbitrage my, my college roommate. Um, but that's when I really got reengaged. And because I sensed this almost revolutionary zeal amongst the people there. And I tell you what, fast forward 18 months, uh, and what I'm seeing really is a cultural revolution. Uh, we have drinks in our office on Wednesday nights. One of the young guys I hired asked me if he could have crypto meetup. And now every Wednesday there's 70, 80, 90 people, and they get there at six and they don't leave until we throw them out at 11. And they're exchanging ideas, and there's, a, there's an energy in the space that I haven't seen in anything in a long, long time. And so the more I dig, the more exciting it gets. Uh, because it's not about just about Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin was an amazing experiment. Uh, it's, it was an amazing revolution in lots of ways. It was a revolution in cryptography, a revolution in, in economics. Can you create this currency with a fixed supply? Um, and then there was Ethereum that really is an architecture to build on top of, almost like a public utility. But 
The real revolution is this revolution of, of decentralized world, decentralized living, right? We have all these big institutions that we come to trust. Some are trustworthy and some aren't. And this community thinks, hey, there's a different way of doing things. And so I think the, you know, the punchline gets missed often when everyone focuses on Bitcoin all the time, when it really is the revolution is moving into a decentralized world. Let's talk for a moment more about that Ether trade. How much did you put down on that marker? Well, um, I put down enough to make a fortune. Uh, because any time you buy something at one and it goes to 400, uh, you don't have to be that smart. But I was trying to buy a lot. It was very difficult to buy. Um, so you would have bought more. I would have bought more. I wanted to buy $2 million worth, uh, which now would be worth $700 million. And originally it was just, you couldn't find them. You know, New York State passed some laws to protect the consumer that you can only buy digital currencies through regulated exchanges. At that point, the only regulated exchanges was run by the two Winklevoss brothers, uh, Gemini, uh, and they weren't trading ether. And so all most young guys, no big deal, we'll set up a, an account in New Jersey and just buy them there. And, you know, but one thing I learned uh, from a long time on Wall Street is uh, don't break the rules. And especially if you get wealthy, really don't break the rules. Um, and so we have a, a, a cheeky sign in our office, we're too rich to go to jail. I get, don't break the rules. And so uh, it was hard for me to accumulate them. You had to buy them OTC. And so I got less than I wanted, but I got plenty. Did you ever imagine that you could make a quarter million dollars on a cryptocurrency? Uh, a quarter, quarter billion. A quarter or million, million, yes, a quarter billion, no. I really, I didn't have that imagination. Actually, interesting enough, you know, my friend, uh, Joe Lubin, who really is a true kind of revolutionary spirit of this thing, he, he hasn't sold a coin. Uh, I still have a macro trader's instinct. And, you know, at one point, I had a young guy quit on me. Uh, and I realized, oh my God, this is going to be like the, the, the internet boom. That he had a really good job, and, but he saw bigger dollar signs elsewhere and he quit. And I looked around and I was like, I had so much money in the space. And I got scared of well, the safety of it. Where is it? Could someone hack it? And, uh, and so I sold a bunch uh, and took some chips off the table, paid my tax, which is painful, uh, but I was a good taxpayer. And, you know, then really dug back in on understanding the security and, 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 and how to really, because on a small amount of money, you don't worry much. When it becomes a giant amount of money, you know, something as simple as, oh, well, take it all and put it in a safe and put it in your, you know, under your kitchen sink. Well, you know, if you have a hundred million dollars sitting on your kitchen sink, you probably won't have a guard there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> After taking this money, these chips, as you say, off the table, how much of your net worth is in crypto right now? You know, because crypto keeps going up, I probably have close to 20, you know, 20, 20 plus percent of my net worth in crypto. Uh, Double what it was a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, listen, I mean, when I made a, I made a speech, the first time I kind of spoke publicly about this since I left Fortress, there was a Harvard Business School, you know, dinner slash panel. And I was just one of four panelists and I, I didn't realize the press was there. And I said, yeah, 10% of my net worth. I think at that point, Bitcoin was trading around 1600 and, and ether was trading around 50 and you know ether's 300 today bitcoins 3800 bucks 3800 plus they gave you another 500 in a split and so you can kind of split adjust 4300 um you know things have gone up tell me something how does someone who immersed himself in macroeconomics for 30 years right who poured over current account deficits who placed bets on interest rate differentials get comfortable conceptually, intellectually, physically even, with something as abstract as cryptocurrencies? You know, in a lot of ways, this is a market like any other market. And you, can, you see the psychology of fear and greed and, 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 and uh, in the charts, the same way you'd see them in the charts of the Indonesian rupee or dollar yen or, or, or treasuries. They're exaggerated because of less liquidity and because you can't get short, there's not a real good way to short. And so when they fall, Jamie Dimon makes a comment, China uh, bans, bans the exchanges, the trend line breaks, they fall a lot farther than they would have in, in other markets because there's just not a short base to cover. And so you go until you reach a new level of, uh, 
of support and kind of rebuild your, your, your base. Um, but I kind of break it up into three buckets. A good chunk of this is a macro trade. This is, like I said, this culture evolution, and I can see the money moving into the space. I've had three to four, you know, key money center banks, the big players out there, the marquee guys, approached us recently just to learn more about the space. They want to trade it. They want to invest in it. They want to bank it. Um, there are going to be futures exchanges set up. There are two competing groups that were in our office this week. Hey, will you partner with us? us? And we're looking at, at both of those pretty carefully. And so the institutional march uh, to bring credibility to this space is, is well on its way. And with that, it's just going to come more money. And so this tide is moving up. Uh, and the experiment, you know, I said a while ago, we went from experiment to implementation. And that's when I got very bush, bullish. When I first bought it, fortunately, the whole thing was a bit of an experiment. Now I'm positive this is implementation. And what I mean by that is, in 1997, 98, when we were talking about the internet, we dreamed what the internet could be. The internet is so much more ubiquitous today than anything we ever dreamed about, right? The same is gonna be with blockchain. You're gonna see blockchain technology everywhere in 10, 15 years. It, it, it's going to be a different world in lots of ways. Now, some of that you won't notice. It's, it's behind the television set. You know, who cares where the wires go, right? Do you really care if all the big corporate treasuries have private blockchains to shift around their money at the end of the day? Oh, you don't. Uh, you won't even notice it, but people are going to lose jobs. It's going to displace people. Where it makes a bigger difference uh, is that the, the technology and the spirit of it cuts out the middleman, right? It's, it's this decentralized world. So in a decentralized world, music doesn't have the big music labels. Artists go direct to consumers through, you know, blockchain. Uh, the coders who are building all this stuff are getting a lot more of the value than they would at, say, Google or Facebook. Uh, your own data, right? Facebook, Google, our health, health insurance, they own our data. In a decentralized world, you're going to own your own identity. Uh, and so when I look forward five, ten years, the, the, the possibilities really get your, your animal spirits going. And so, so you're excited. You're I'm also excited. serious. Dead serious. But you know, you have to know, the way some of your peers look at this, right? Mike Novogratz loses a pile of money at Fortress, makes an involuntary <laughs> exit, finds himself in India, and comes back as the wannabe <laughs> king of Bitcoin. You know, everyone would love to leave Wall Street gracefully, and uh, very few do. Uh, you know, you get kicked in the knees or kicked in the midsection, and you look at, learn from your mistakes, you kind of rebuild, and you, uh, you start your new, you know, you start your new adventure. Um, I started this as a, you know, I set up a family office. I've been investing in lots of things. And uh, what has really got me excited about this space is just, I do see it's kind of revolutionary. It's not a money thing, uh, you know, because it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's a responsibility to manage money for other people. It's a responsibility to hire lots of people that, you know, you don't necessarily need. But I think there is, you know, and I always ask myself, what role can I play in this community? I'm not a coder. Uh, I don't really do a great job understanding the back. They have to explain it seven times and then I kind of get it. Uh, I don't have great domain expertise in any one spot. Right? The, 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 the whole space is about, do you have great domain expertise in something and can you pair that person with the, the engineering team? And so if you, there'll be a blockchain for wine. The guy in wine is going to know everything about wine and how it gets sold and how it gets authenticated and how it gets, you know, all the details. Macro guys aren't detail guys by any stretch. And so my role really is, is pairing some of those guys up. It's putting capital into the system. And at times it's, it's bridging the institutional gap into the space. But you've also had to invest time in understanding this. Yeah. You had to add it all up. How many hours? Hundreds, hundreds. And, you know, I have a very patient friend in Joe Lubin who I go to and I get tutorial and then I come back and I ask dumb questions again. Uh, but all over the space. But, but if your vision is going to end up being reality, aren't all of the people who came from your world 
all of the traditionalists, the Wall Street folks, going to have to spend hundreds of hours Stevie boning Cohn, up? Stevie Cohn had a big dinner at his house last night. I, I, I didn't go, but you know, lots of people I know went. Big dinner at Stevie Cohn's house to try to understand the space. Every hedge fund manager I know is at least investigating, trying to understand the space. And so I laugh at Jamie Dine and oh, I'll fire anyone who, who sells Bitcoin. Good for the space. What he buys, maybe I'll, I'll get nervous. Uh, but mark my words, he will get stopped into this market because it's, listen, I'm not saying valuations don't get to stupid levels and, and some companies right now are already at stupid levels. What about some of the obvious issues, let's say, right? The roller coaster volatility, the initial coin offerings promoted by Floyd Mayweather, right? Who now calls himself crypto and Paris Hilton. The mysteries like who on earth is you know, Satoshi Nakamoto. Right. And then, of course, all the smug arrogance that comes along with this world. Yes. So, listen, the ICO market uh, is, you know, part wonderful. And there's some amazing entrepreneurs and amazing ideas in it. Uh, there's fraud. There's some quick get rich, quick schemes. It's the Wild West. It's the Wild West. And so when I think of how I invest, I have a macro hat and a macro piece to try to understand what's really moving the market. And then there really is a VC slash micro detail focused piece. We have a full team of people looking at each of these things and meeting the companies. And in some ways, you know, you want to be long good companies at stupid prices and short bad companies at stupid prices because all the prices are way ahead of where they should be. Uh, one of the advantages of being a macro guy is you understand psychology of bubbles and kind of how to ride the horse. Like there's, there's not one Warren Buffett, you know, Graham investor that's going to be buying any of these ICOs because they don't represent value. Uh, and it really is kind of the tech investor mind uh, of opening up your imagination to these disruptive technologies. You encountered no shortage of oddballs in your career on Wall Street. <laughs> Let's just take a moment, right? You're a Princeton grad. You're a U.S. Army helicopter pilot. You're a partner at Goldman Sachs. You're sitting here in a Tom Ford suit. How do you deal with the Bitcoin world? I mean, it's like Dungeons and Dragons on steroids. You know, if you kind of think about the journey of the last 30 years, it's been the revenge of the nerds. Uh, I mean, it's... <laughs> Bitcoin I, I, is the revenge of the nerds. Well, the whole tech boom is revenge of the nerds, right? I mean, it used to be the... The athletes got the supermodel, and now it's you know the guy that founded Twitter. Um, and what's unique about this world is you get all kinds. You do have the Dungeons and Dragons coders, uh, but you've got an unbelievable core of very earnest people that are, are quasi-revolutionary. I was talking to a guy who ran a huge quantitative trading business, made enough money shut it down and literally him and five guys sit in a room and code on the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain just to make it better. Almost like philanthropy. Uh, they don't get paid for it. There's an intellectual uh, compensation if you actually make changes to the code and there's a very formal process of how that code gets changed and you, know, you kind of win points among that coding community. Um, I've spent some time, not a lot, with Vitalik Buterin, the, the kind of boy genius who founded uh, Ethereum, and I would tell you, like, he's built a $20 billion market cap enterprise. Uh, his portion of that that he's kept for himself is minuscule. He's in it because he's a benign dictator that sees this as a revolution. A, a benign dictator in that Ethereum coding space, but this is like a revolutionary move to him. It's not a, you know, it's not uh, Travis who, who ran Uber, who, you know, owned a big chunk of the company. And I'm not knocking the, 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 those guys, but. The, the, there, so there really is a, a core of the people at the center of this thing that, that see this as bigger than themselves. Once upon a time, the smartest people, in theory, went to work at Goldman Sachs. And then they went to work at Google. And then they went to work at Facebook. Is this where they're going now? I just hired a 23 and a half year old kid who was one year into his two year thing at Goldman Sachs and he bolted. And he had a great job and he's a stunningly bright kid uh, today. Uh, and so Joe Lubin and the guys at Consensus, us at our hedge fund, I'm sure all over this place, have their pick of hiring people. The, 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 the young people see this as the next grand opportunity. Now listen. My brother quit Goldman Sachs uh, about to work at a, uh, 
an internet startup about four months before the, the, the market crashed, and then was like, oh shit, <laughs> you know, uh, he's doing just fine now. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, young kids often f flow to, you know, the, the excitement. Um, but I really see unbelievable talent going into this, in this space. And, you know, the best programmers at places like IBM are leaving to go work on uh, in more dynamic uh, places like consensus. There's a big debate, a raging debate over cryptocurrencies, which is, what are they really? You know, are they, you traded currencies hey, for the better part of your career. Yeah, they're career. not currencies, which is a, you they're know, not. they're not. Um, Currencies. Well, at least we've resolved that. We've resolved that. Currencies need to be stable, right? As much as I spent my years, you know, hours, weeks looking at dollar yen and the euro, when you step back and walk away from the screens, dollar yen has been plus or minus 15% for much of the last 15 years. Um, the euro the same way. And on a, any given year, this is the biggest year the dollars moved 10%. Um, and so, for something to be a Bitcoin dropped 30% in two weeks. For something to be a currency, you need stability. Um, right? I'm not going to buy this glass one day for a dollar and it's going to be $7 you know, a week later. Um, and so when I think of Bitcoin, I think its use case really becomes digital gold. It's a store of value. Like, okay. we, don't, we don't buy and sell in gold, uh, nor do we do it in Google shares. Right? I'll buy that suit for half a Google share. Right? No. But, but you could, I'll say, you know. And, and so I think people get fussed up around Bitcoin as a currency. It really is going to be a store of value. Um, and there's, you know, it's a limited supply. One reason also, currencies, limited supply currencies never work. They're too easy and manipulable. They squeeze up and squeeze down. And so I see Bitcoin going much higher because there are very few of them. And lots of people are going to want to buy them because it becomes just a store of value. How high? You know, it could, the hard part about speculative fevers is they can really go to places you can't think of. So if you think about 1999, we didn't have these things. And what's interesting about a cell phone uh, is that it gives everybody on the planet access to, uh, everybody on the planet access to participating in this ecosystem. In 1999, during the tech bubble, if you were an upper middle class Korean or Taiwanese or Indian, you couldn't buy Cisco or play in our stock market. Everybody on the planet can play in this. So you're making it sound to me as though you buy into the Metcalf's law valuation for Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, that it's the, you know, the value of the network is the square of the number of the participants. Is that is that, I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm asking you, what, what valuation models apply so to cryptocurrency? The way I think about Ethereum valuation, to start with that is, I look at Ether as a commodity, and think of it as fuel, and you need a little bit of fuel for each calculation that gets done on the Ethereum blockchain. And so if I think of the future and how many calculations get done on these things, how many transactions, and I, multiply that by a little bit of fuel, the market cap should be the net present value of the discounted cash flows. And so what will constrain the price growth is how fast the network can grow. And so both the Bitcoin uh, blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain have big issues with speed at this point. Now, the bet you make is there are a lot of smart people working on that problem. It, to give you some sense about the scale of the community, so Consensus, I keep talking about this company because that's kind of the ecosystem company for Ethereum. Um, it's the commercialization business of the, 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 of the Ether project. They put up... Which company? Consensus put oh. on, online for free developer apps. Me and you would never download those in a million years. You know, only coders would download developer apps. Over 105,000 people have downloaded developer apps. You don't download a developer app unless you're going to code with it. Right? It's not like I'm just going to put it in my back pocket. And so there's 105,000 people working on this ecosystem. And so the idea, the bet I'm making is that these guys are really bright and they will stay ahead of fixing. But we actually kind of trade the, the spikes on this. How far ahead can it get from how fast the network goes? Let's tuck your uh, 
just have to stick the wire, stuff, stuff it back there. That's, that's, yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, how do you know when to buy and sell? How do you trade this thing? You know, there are multiple ways to trade. One is, it's just macro. And so I trade the, the ballet of the charts, the ballet of the prices. I always tell people I need a story and a chart. And there's a lot of information. And so part of it is event driven and access to information. So one of the things we keep trying to, I keep trying to do is put myself in the center of the ecosystem. It's when you're a center of the ecosystem and it's a, still a relatively small world, you know what's happening. And so when the Ethereum Alliance got announced, it was well telegraphed that it was gonna get announced. You talk to people, you knew it was gonna get announced, and then it gets announced and the price goes way, way up. And so I would call that an event-driven trade. Um, the broad trading of it is macro, though. You'll see mini zeniths and euphorias, and so I will sold at 5,000, or 40, 4980, I actually sold some Bitcoin, and then, you know, three weeks later, trying to buy it in the low 3,000s. And, uh, you know, listen, if you're good at that and you're a trading junkie, it's a lot of fun. It does increase your tax bill. <laughs> and so for some people to just sit, sit and sit, that's a different strategy. But the other part of it is this investing part. It's almost like a long short equity mindset or a venture capital mindset, all these ICOs and pre-ICOs. And, you know, for us, sponsoring and helping these companies figure out how to go through the system, you, you, get, a, you get a buy in at a discount. And, uh, you know, there's a profitable business in that as well. You're trading what? Bitcoin? We trade Ether? We, I've, Jesus I've, coin? I've, not in Jesus coin. I've taken the approach to participate in all sides of the ecosystem. So I have mines, investments in mining. Uh, to create new coins. To create new coins. You know, that's been an interesting business. It's been a money loser for us in local currency terms, right? I spent Bitcoins to buy a Bitcoin mine. If I had spent dollars to buy a Bitcoin mine, I would have made a lot of money. But you were better off just owning the Bitcoins. And in Ether, you were far better off just owning the Ether than building Ether mine. But what the mines do, do is you plug into that community and it's an amazing information source of how this whole ecosystem is working. But we also invest in, I've invested in three exchanges, you know, way back. We've invested in, so equity of companies, mm -hmm. kind of venture capital. We've invested uh, in, in, uh, in, in an ICO, so pre-ICOs and ICOs, which an ICO, think about it, it's like an equity offering. It's not allowed to be an equity offering, so it's not an equity offering. And, you know, the SEC is coming down with some regulations on what is an okay ICO and what's not an okay ICO. Okay ICO. What's unique about that is the SEC only said these are bad. By definition, means the other ones are, right now are okay. And so our regulators have been very open-minded. From the first time I went down to the Fed in 2014 and talked about Bitcoin, um, I think these guys see this as a real, you know, positive fundamental thing in the long run. And they're trying to help guide it and understand where to, where to get in and not get in. Where, where are you trading? What platforms? So, you know, we're fairly large and so we, trade at lots of different exchanges. And one of the tricks or the, the risks in this business right now is the riskiest money you have in the system is being left on the exchanges because it's no central clearing there. And there's they you know they don't they're not that well capitalized and and so you don't leave that much money on the exchanges. And so we we trade in lots of them. Um, you know, Gemini here in New York, the, the, the Cameron and Tyler's exchange is, is, is one of our go-to places. Because that got regulated, you feel a little bit better about it. And, you know, I know those guys, so, so if something really bad happened, I go down and, and give them a shot. <laughs> <laughs> How important is the arrival of uh, Bitcoin options and futures? I think it's going to be great. Uh, anything that helps add liquidity to the space is great for a market. You know, it's going to take longer than you think. No one has really figured out how to do it, bring leverage into this system yet. Um, and so we're going to be a participant, uh, you know, be market makers in, in those things. But my guess is it takes a while. So it's going to be great. It sounds like a lot of things are going to be great. Yep. But there are plenty of arguments, at least as many arguments against cryptocurrencies as there are arguments in favor of them. Um, which arguments against have merit? Any of them? Listen, there's a technical piece. They need, you know, we're still, I said we're in implementation. We're in implementation, but we don't have the use cases 
in 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 action yet. So Blythe Matt, So this is like so Blythe, this is like the internet circa what? 1994. 94. Blythe Masters is a it, like Netscape is just getting big. Well, Blythe, Blythe and her company, uh, Digital Assets, is doing a, uh, not, I'm, I forgot what her company was called, is doing a project in the Australian stock market where they're literally going to put the entire Australian stock market on the blockchain. Uh, I'm not invested in that company. I cross my fingers and say two prayers that she succeeds. Because that'll be a huge use case. Think about it, an entire stock market sure. all on the blockchain. And that's happening, you know. So... We need to have, the, 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 the space needs to have some wins like that. And I think people will be like, okay. And so that's a risk that you'll have some early failures. Uh, There's some pretty credible naysayers out there. Jamie Dimon, for example, CEO of JP Morgan. He called it a- What's interesting is the same day Jamie Dimon is, is making those comments, his San Francisco office is hosting a Bitcoin- It's true. Platform. And so- well, it's not just him, right? So he calls it a fraud. Ray Dalio calls it a bubble. Howard Marks well, says it's not real. He said it and he kind of took it back. Listen, it is a bubble. This is going to be the largest bubble of our lifetimes. And so, but remember, bubbles happen around things that fundamentally change the way we live. The railroad bubble, I think railroads really fundamentally changed the way we lived. The internet bubble changed the way we live. And so prices are going to get way, above, uh, way ahead of where they should be. You can make a whole lot of money uh, on the way up, and we plan on it. Uh, at one point, you're going to have to sell. I, you know, I, I don't anticipate just sitting here and watching my money go up and down. And up and, like, we're going to be active and try to buy the right companies. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ICOs that are going to go to zero. Um, and so uh, it's a dangerous space. I wouldn't tell someone to put 100% of your net worth in it. One of the reasons I've sold some is because I got, had so much of my net worth in it. Uh, but should everybody have some? I think everybody should have some. Um, I really do. I think, again, this is not going away. Uh, even when you try to regulate it away, it's, it's difficult. Like, the regulation, in a weird way, is a good thing. A, it credentializes it to some degree, uh, as long as it's smart regulation. Now, what China's doing is interesting, right? China said we're banning, banning the exchanges. And my own sense is, and this is not as well of a thought out opinion as I'd like it to be, but my own sense is that China, like in many things, wants China to really be able to participate and, and win in this space. And so slow things down until we really understand how we want to win. Um, like Alibaba, Amazon, right? You know, like, or, or they, they haven't let the financial system f uh, firm still in, into China. And so that protective side of, uh, and listen, this is about decentralization. And that's kind of against the exact core of how China likes to think of themselves. Can cryptocurrencies, again, we're still calling them currencies, but can crypto, can Bitcoin, Ether, et cetera, thrive long term if China doesn't participate? Sure. It's, it's a big world. Uh, there are 193 countries. And so, you know, things shift. It's very difficult to regulate. I mean, one of the problems that banks will have and, you know, hedge funds will have is, you know, right now with securities, we have rules on if you're gonna if you're gonna trade and you work at goldman sachs you need to get it approved and and they can completely track who trades because you've got accounts you know you've got you've got uh, encrypted accounts on people's cell phones where they can move around hundreds of millions of dollars uh and so things like you know front running rules and employer trading rules are, are much more difficult to uh uh to enforce but given the concerns that we've talked about and you've acknowledged that people have, is it possible maybe the Chinese are taking a prudent step in around exchanges, around ICOs? I think ICOs will ha have more regulation. I mean, I think they, they, they will. You know, I think the, listen, the U.S. government loves crowdsourcing and this is a crowdsourcing mechanism in lots of ways. And so, but the U.S. government also feels an obligation to protect the little guy from, you know, being duped. And that balance is a tough line to walk. Uh, it would not surprise me that we have more regulation in this space, not less, uh, going forward. I don't think that's a terrible thing. Um, I really don't. Um, what's unique, you can build a lot of uh, 
safeguards into the coins themselves. I mean, what's so unique about the, the smart contract component of the Ethereum space is that uh, if I wanted to have a coin that only can get sold to wa wallets registered in Istanbul, I can have a coin that can only get sold and, and they can't trade elsewhere. Um, and so, you Well, know, you can build it that way and it might work that way. Right. But some of these things have already proved themselves subject to hacking. Listen, the, the, the Ethereum uh, blockchain itself and, and the Bitcoin blockchain seem pretty spectacularly well built. Uh, stuff that gets built on top is only as good as the people that built it. Uh, the, the best case of that was the DAO, this crowdsourced venture capital fund uh, that was built poorly and quickly got hacked. And, uh, and so, but that's the market sorts that out in time. Um, Do you have any regrets about the way this has played out? Your former partners at Fortress, Wes Edens, Pete Brigger, are, uh, are doing pretty well on the sale to, uh, to SoftBank. Yeah, listen, I wish them nothing but luck uh, and, and in good spirit. Wes and I are partners in a, a hotel out in uh, Jackson Hole. Pete and I talk all the time. Pete's a big advocate of Bitcoin, and he, he quietly uh, you know, has been a, a, a collector of it, let me, let me say it that way, uh, and a supporter. Uh, and so... Uh, I got nothing but, but you know, goodwill, goodwill with those guys. Um, you know, it, I also was lucky enough that I didn't sell all my stock. Uh, you know, I bought some, some stock, so it went up. At least I had a little schmuck insurance uh, from that move from, you know, five to eight. Um, but, you know, it's always an interesting argument. You, you, one door shuts and you, another one opens. You know, both of those guys have five more years grinding away. Uh, and I think they've got an exciting platform. You know, Masa Sal's a pretty dynamic guy, uh, and they've got a lot of assets to work with. And so it's just a different path, but I don't regret it. I really don't. I, uh, I love my office. I'm doing a lot of neat things. Uh, you know, no one likes to get kicked in the, in the knees uh, and, and, and fumble the, fumble the ball. Uh, this is a business where we like to win, and so. Um, but, you know, I, I always think of one of my friends during one of the first times I screwed up, a friend in the army called him and he was like, you know, Patton didn't win every battle. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to that. You know, very few people win every battle. And so I think it's how you bounce back that makes the, the journey exciting. Very good, sir. That was great. Thank awesome. you.